there's no smell so distinctly Australian as eucalyptus. It was the first indigenous product to be exported in the early years of European settlement. And ever since, its medicinal and therapeutic properties have kept it a household staple. In all those years, little has changed in eucalyptus oil production. That is, until recently. In central Victoria, an ambitious project has transformed a wild bush product into a 21st century super tree, as Tim Lee reports. In the forests of central Victoria, the age of steam is alive and well. This ancient boiler powers a primitive distillery, extracting eucalyptus oil in a manner that has changed little since the pioneers who first discovered its remarkable properties. You've got the boiler fired by the old leaf and the steam comes down up that tube behind you there, slowly works right through the bin and comes down out of the big tube out there in the condenser then it hits water and it comes back to a liquid form. And as it, you see it coming out here, and oil and water come together and the water pushes the oil out and the oil comes to the top and turn the tap and there it is. We still use that pretty simple method of steam distillation. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's nice as well. It's such a natural product. People realise that it really is just such a natural process to extract the oil from the leaf just through steam distillation. The bush air is awash with the very distinctive aromatic smell of eucalyptus. They really can smell me all the time coming, they really the eucalyptus there. Des Lamprell has worked this distillery for more than 30 years, mostly on his own. I like the open, the open country, out in the forest on the own, I get on well with myself. The leaves of all eucalypts contain oil, but the sweetest is derived from eucalyptus polybractea, commonly known as blue mallee. It's also one of the best medicinal oils, so it's high in cineol, which is sort of considered the, the key medicinal attribute of eucalyptus oil. So it's fantastic for killing germs as an antibacterial, but also has that beautiful fragrance which people love to use. I wouldn't have a full list, but it does go into toothpaste, soaps, laundry powders, dishwashing. It's used as a disinfectant and antiseptic and a solvent. It goes into cough sweets, of course, cough syrup, all sorts of rubs. Eucalyptus oil is used extensively worldwide, but Australia's market share is small. There are some small family-run enterprises, but by far the largest is Felton, Grimwade and Basistos, owned by the Abbott family. The Blue Mallee is fundamental to their business. This stunted species grows in a narrow belt on the thin, hard soils of central Victoria and 400 kilometres to the north at West Wyalong in central New South Wales. Both districts have long been at the centre of Australia's eucalyptus oil industry. Traditionally, oil distillers have harvested patches of crown lease forest. This is a naturally occurring stand of Blue Mallee. These trees are harvested every two years, and as you can see, they're quite sparse in how they grow. But more crucially, they're quite low in oil content. At present, these trees are yielding only a fraction of what they normally give. What's happened with the, the yield? Why is it dropped, do you think? They, they, they reckon they might, might be because it's growing too quick after the floods. They don't, don't really know. They can't work it out why. That's a bit of a mystery to them. Perhaps the flood rains of two years ago were to blame. Regardless, low yields mean higher production costs. Eucalyptus oil may be the very essence of Australia, but the domestic industry endures fierce competition from cheaper imported eucalyptus oil. Most eucalyptus oil now is imported from China and it's imported from uh, Tasmanian blue gums or eucalyptus globulus and that's all hand cut. Uh, they've got some hillsides and they've had cheap labour in the past. They're not going to have so cheap labour in the future. Uh, it's, it's pretty crudely done. Peter Abbott is the owner of Australia's most famous brand of eucalyptus oil. The name Basisto back to 1852. And the Parrot brand has been a household essential for many ever since. 
Joseph Pazisto was the original uh, eucalyptus oil distiller in, uh, in Australia and the first one to uh, sell eucalyptus oil commercially. But in today's business environment, success requires more than a famous brand and a rich heritage. For a start, there's uncertainty about the long-term security of being able to harvest state forest. So since 2000, Peter Abbott has been on a personal crusade that will underpin the industry's very future. Enlisting expertise from the University of Melbourne, he has overseen an extensive search for a super strain of Blue Mallee. We've looked right throughout uh, northwestern Victoria, in the Inglewood region, north of Bendigo. We've been up to the West Wyalong area in uh, New South Wales, and uh, we've really probably screened, yeah, literally thousands of trees. And out of that screen has come about 20, just over 20, what we call super trees, or our best clones. And they really fit as many of those criteria uh, as possible. This looks really good. We've got about 500 different uh, clones here and they're really showing some fantastic uh, oil gland development. Just look, you can see these beautiful glands uh, in the leaves yeah. here. First and foremost is high oil content. We've got a hierarchy of traits that we've been looking for. Uh, obviously oil is right up the top of the list and not only quantity but quality. And we're also interested in their growth rate and we're interested in the ratio of leaf to stick, as the growers call it, which is really the stem to leaf ratio. Amongst the exotic plants and stately buildings of the university's botany department, this trial plot of blue mallees may look nondescript, but it represents a new frontier. Till now, work on eucalypts worldwide has centered on wood production not on leaf yield. When you think of the agricultural systems throughout the world, we've been developing them for millennia. And this is you know, very much in its formative stages when you've only been doing it for, for 10 years. And because of the long breeding time of these trees, it takes quite a while to develop the systems. But we think we're, we're really starting to make some progress. We're interested in water use efficiency. Uh, that is how much biomass we can get per unit rainfall. Uh, and quite a few other traits. We don't want insects to eat the trees, of course, so we want insect resistance, pathogen resistance. So as we work down the inventory, we're, we're you know, a challenge in our breeding program. So this one we've got into culture and we've uh, managed to get quite a few plants uh, propagated from it. Yeah, this one's got a really beautiful uh, leaf to stick ratio. I think it'll be a really good performer in the plantation this year. The breeding program is best seen at the company's field site at Glenalbin northwest of Bendigo. Aside from their orderly rows, outwardly these trees don't look much different from their natural bush counterparts. But these specimens in the seed nursery are the elite and their first class genetic material makes them very productive and desirable parents. Whereas developing a seed orchard we can just get the high oil plants to breed with each other and produce hopefully the millions of seeds that Peter needs for the plantations. Jason, this is a uh, great seeding year, much better than we've had in, for years. And uh, the seeds are phenomenal on some of these trees. It's just uh, amazing. Look at the seeds on this, it's just... Well, we've had some good rainfall and we've uh, had plenty of light now that we've opened up the canopy by removing some of the rocks. There's five to seven seeds in each capsule, is that right? Jason? That's right. So when you th see how many capsules there are on a tree, that's a lot of seeds for your plantation. Close by, the carefully propagated offspring is getting its chance to spread its roots into the newly worked soil. During the past few years, in the cooler months, two million Blue Mallee seedlings have been planted on more than 800 hectares. These are some of the half a million going in this year at the rate of about 7,000 a day. The economics of this venture have to stack up. Buying land and planting trees is costly. I think you can't get away from those ag risks, you know, um, and, and that's just a risk we're going to have to continue to bear. Um, you know, just because the trees are planted in, in, in nice straight rows um, doesn't mean that you're any less exposed to, to how much rain they get or, you know, the, the, the seasonal um, conditions. So what are going in have to be far superior to their bush relations. 
And that is indeed the case. In a range of three to four times better in here, which is, is great. You know, if you go out into the average plot or field around here, you might get one and a half percent oil on average, whereas, you know, in a plantation like this, we can get up to five percent or more. Yeah, four or five years, and I reckon we'll have plenty of seed out of this orchard. When Landline visited in 2005, the Melbourne University scientists had just discovered a method of propagating the notoriously tricky blue mallee. And we've managed to clone those, so propagate them in tissue culture. And so we've put out hundreds of them out in this field, and with the aim of they'll grow up and be a, a good seed source for high yielding oil in the future. All the dots in the... Uh... It's a, a very needle in a haystack sort of search, trying to find good uh, seed trees and it, the big ones uh, that are, are left here are really the basis of, uh, for cloning and for seed collection. Now these are the super trees, cloned in a world breakthrough achieved at Melbourne University earlier this year. It's a major breakthrough, uh, yes, no, that, that really gives us uh, a time frame in which we, we can actually get it up and, uh, and running. I'm really excited about uh, that, uh, that happening. It may have been a world first, but like much in science, the first so-called super trees failed to live up to their initial promise. I think we had 1,500 trees in that um, plot uh, C that, that you filmed at that time, and really win them, and we kept hoping we'd find one of them would come good, but none of them did, and we had to take all of them out. Nature is one of those strange things. It's not like chemicals in a factory. You, what happens in agriculture, you think you've got the answer, and uh, nature shows that you haven't got the answer. The new, greatly improved trees have been carefully assessed and documented. Every tree is numbered and we know its parent and where it came from. We know its uh, history, we know whether it's, it's seeded or not and when it's seeded, we know its oil content. We can even tell the different constituents that are in the oil to see that they all meet our standards. So we have done a huge amount of work in the laboratory to analyse the oil and make sure that it's as perfect as we can get it. Well, this is a better looking one. This oh, is, that's uh, well grown, isn't it? Only a year old and uh, terrific for a it's year. It's look, looking uh, pretty good. I'll just have a look and see what the oil yield okay. looks like. Ah, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's looking good. Oh, that's excellent. So if they're all like that. We'll be very pleased. Very happy. There's some healthy competition amongst the humans as well. Yeah. We all seem to go up to a tree and pick a leaf and put it up to the sun and see if we can see high oil. It becomes quite a habit. And I think there's a bit of competition between the, the School of Botany people and the FGV who can get the, uh, the highest tree. It's quite extraordinary the amount of uh, time and effort that you've got to put in to finding a tree. We've now discovered 15 to 20 of them that really meet our criteria. That's been a very uh, long but interesting and fulfilling journey, really, I must say. When Peter Abbott bought Felton, Grimwade and Bazistos in 1974, the company was close to collapse. In the years since, he has restored the brand to its former prominence and overseen its growth into a far wider range of pharmaceutical, industrial and household products. He is an excellent businessman. He, he always thinks about their business angle to his enterprises. But I think the really impressive thing about Peter is that he's passionate about eucalypts, he cares about the local community, and he has this vision that we can do this in Australia. And he's really put his money where his mouth is. I mean, he did look at, you know, uh, moving into China. He's worked with people in Western Australia. But at the end of the day, he decided that he can do this project in Victoria and under the umbrella of his company. And uh, to me, that is the hallmark of a visionary. Uh, the seed orchards are very important uh, part of uh, operations in that Persisto's eucalyptus oil has been on the market since 1852. It's uh, Australia's first uh, export of, a, uh, of something that's really Australian, so it goes back a long way and I feel more like the custodian of the company rather than the owner of it. The company's growth of recent years is stretching the capacity of its factory in Melbourne. This was constructed in 2008, so around about six years ago now. But already it's uh, starting to burst at the seams a little bit with the growth that we've experienced. We're experiencing some, some good demand for natural products, so we're already starting to think about where the next warehousing space is going to come from. 
there's a huge amount of consumer demand out there for natural products and it's a little bit ironic because this has been a product that's been natural for, as I said, over 160 years um, and continues to be so. So there's a lot of trust associated with that. At 84, Peter Abbott is still dreaming. He wants the company to be the most efficient eucalyptus producer in the world. The harvesting of millions of high-yielding trees holds the key. I really enjoy the thought of Australia being at a lower cost than China in uh, producing eucalyptus oil, which originated in Australia. I just think that's something to look forward to. The acid test will come next year, when the first of the plantation super trees will be large enough to harvest. We've all got our fingers crossed for that, but after all the work that's gone on and all the analysis that we've done with the leaves, we're feeling pretty confident that we'll have a very a bumper harvest mm, of high oil, which will be fantastic. The collaboration between the scientists and the company has already been very fruitful. There are plans to plant more trees. By the end of this season, we will have planted two and a half million trees, and you sort of think, gosh, surely that's enough, but you know, what's next? Well, then, in order to harvest them properly, we need a bigger distillery, more distilleries, um, and what comes after that? So, yeah, continuous investment, but I guess that's what it's all about. You really got to reinvest uh, into the future to maintain that position. It is a very important part in that sense.